So the title of our message this morning is Christmas Joy. I'm going to start with a story this morning. There was a family during the Great Depression. And this family was, was poor like everyone else. It was broke. They couldn't afford anything except the, the very basic of necessities. Well, one day they heard that the circus was coming to town. And back then, a ticket to go to the circus was one dollar. Of course, you can imagine that that was, was a lot of money back then, right? Back back back. Today, there's a little boy, he come running up to his daddy, and he said, Daddy, do you think I can get the money to go to the circus? Well, the dad, regretfully, he told the little boy, he said, Look, I'd love for you to go, but I don't have the money. But I'll tell you what. If you just go out and maybe get you some odd jobs or something, you might could earn enough money to get you go. And Daddy said, listen, and I'll tell you what I can do. Whatever you earn, he said, I I'll match that. I can do that for you. I'll match whatever it is that you get, I'll add to it. All right, so boys, he's all excited, right? So he goes about it. He gets him some side jobs, and, and he's working around the neighborhood and everything. And then with what the daddy Chip did, you know, the boy had enough. So the day come when he got ready and the circus was coming into town, he had already bought his ticket. So he rushes downtown. And there it is, all the circus. They're in a big parade. They're headed down Main Street. Boy, he was all excited. He's watching the clowns, right? All the lions and the elephants and, and the tigers and, and the different circus performers are all marching down the street, having a good time. Well, about then, a clown came dancing up to the little boy. And the little boy, he's all excited. So he hands the clown his ticket. And then he finishes watching as they continue passing by, and they go on down the street until they're out of sight. See, this little boy, he's all excited now, right? So he rushes home. He wants to tell Daddy all about it. But the father, he was surprised. He thought, wow. He's home off early. Seems like he should have been gone longer. So we asked the boy, he said, go ahead, boy, tell me what, describe the circus to me. Tell me what it was like. So the boy starts telling him everything about it, right? He's all excited and how he'd seen him walking down the street and, and how the clown had come up to him and how he'd give him his ticket. And the father, he sadly took the boy by the arm. He said, look, son, you didn't see the circus. You only seen the parade. And you know, the story right here reminds me of, of our Christmases today. You see, people get all caught up with trees. They get all caught up with the decorations. They get all caught up with putting up the lights, buying the presents and getting the food ready and, and people coming over and going over here and there. In the reality, though, what they're only doing is they're just seeing the parade. Yeah. They ain't got to the Christmas. They're missing the main event. They're missing the true joy of Christmas. Yes. And I want each of you to know what that real joy is. Amen? Yeah. It's not just the parade. Yes. There's more to it than all of those things that we just mentioned. You see, in the story that the First Lady read this morning, the angel said, do not be afraid. Yes. Behold, I bring you good news yes. of a great joy, Come on. which shall be for all people. Thank you. you hear what I said? A joy for all people. Yes. For today in the city, the city of David, there has been a Savior born for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's Christ the Lord. Don't you know that the joy of Christmas, it comes through receiving God's gift. Yes. And that gift is our Savior. That gift is Jesus Christ. You. you know, even people who haven't been saved can enjoy some Christmas time, right? Yes, they can have a good time and get together with friends. They also get excited about putting up the lights and the presents and, 
and the food and the festivities and all that. Right? Everybody can have a good time, huh? But what I'm talking about is something different. Remember, we talked about different a moment ago. Yeah. There is something different that those of us who have accepted this gift get to share. There's something deeper. Yeah. I'm talking about the joy of Christmas that lasts all year long, not just for a season, not just for a day or two. I'm talking about all year. I'm talking about every single day. Yeah. I'm talking about a joy because you have peace. You have a peace that the Bible says it passes all understanding. You don't even know why you have it, but you have it. You have it because of Christ. You have it because of that gift. You have it because of our Savior. You see, that peace is in you. It doesn't mean that you don't have troubles. It doesn't mean that you don't go through trials or tribulations. But when you're going through those trials, you can still find joy inside. Because you have Christ. That is the peace. You will struggle. As a matter of fact, the Bible guarantees you as a Christian, you will even suffer more. But he gives us peace to get us through. I've had it asked, and I've shared my story before, going through some of the worst times of my life. I was on a business trip with a salesman. And I'll save all the details, but on our way home, I, I think nobody knows anything, but people know but he turns off the radio and he says, how do you do it? I'm thinking, how do I do what? <laughs> right? He says, how do you get through every single day? You come in here and act like everything's okay. He said, I know what you're going through. And the only thing I could think to say at that moment was I pray a lot. And then there was a pause. And he reached up and turned the radio back on. Of course, I'm kicking myself. I'm thinking, wow, this is my chance to testify and, and all that, right? I kicked myself for like three days. So finally, the Lord spoke to me and said, that's what I wanted you to say. Yeah. The point is, people can see that. There's a peace in you. I had joy yeah. because of the Lord. That gave me a peace. It doesn't mean that I wasn't struggling. It doesn't mean that I wasn't having a hard time. It doesn't mean that I wasn't feeling bad. In, in going up and down in moods and whatever. We're going to deal with these emotions. But there was a peace inside of me that others could see. That's Christ. That's a gift from our Father. Amen? Amen. You have this peace because you know that you're right with your Creator. And that's the peace that brings us joy that we're talking about. Let's do our next song. And you're going to see where we do this song and how it ties into the rest of the sermon.
guys did too. Yeah. So as we figure, as we continue on, the news about that Savior, we know that it brings great joy. Amen? Amen. And you see, not only is that good news for those of us who've already been saved, that's good news for the sinners. Yeah. That's good news for the walking dead out there. That's good news for those who haven't accepted Christ as their Savior. This is the news that we're supposed to be spreading. Yes. Right? What I want us to do is I want us to think about that awesome experience that those shepherds must have experienced out there, right, in the fields. It's awesome, and it? It's exhilarating. As it was, I, I can only imagine that it had to come with some fear. Think about that. You're out there in the dark, right? You got a little fire going, and you're, you're staying warm, and uh, you're chatting with the boys. All of a sudden, bam! It brightens up like someone just turned the lights on at Wrigley Field, right? Amen. All the big lights are bright and shining. And then angels just pop up out of nowhere. You tell me you wouldn't be a little afraid? I would. Think about them sitting in the dark. Think about that representing the darkness of the world. Think about that representing the, the sin, the lost of the human race. You see, they were in darkness. You see where this is going? Come on now. It's getting good. Get myself excited. The Bible gives us several examples of people who have encounters with God and they were fearful. See, because it, as amazing as that is, it's a fearful thing. Right? Remember when God appeared on Mount Sinai? Right? The mountains were shaking. There was lightning all about it. You gotta imagine yourself, not just a storm in the distance. But just think about it. you've had them storms where it's like right on top of you, right? This is how it was. Thundering and lightning, flashing all around them, big thick cloud, trumpets blowing. The Bible says there's a sound like a trumpet. Would that not be a little scary? Of course it would. There's a fear there. God came down to the base of the, the mountain. He wanted to talk to the people. That's, that put fear in the people, yeah. right? It scared them so bad that they told Moses, look, you go up and talk to God. Yeah. Huh? You remember reading that? Yeah, they were so afraid. It was such an a, a awesome thing, but a fearful thing. Yeah. Just imagine your creator coming down and doing all this is going on. They were fearful. So they said, Moses, you go on up there and talk to God. We're going to wait right here for you. See, there was fear. Isaiah, he saw, he, saw a bit, uh, he saw God through a vision, right? And he cried out, he said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Why did he say that? You know why? Because he realized at that moment, being in the presence of God, even in this vision, that he was a sinner. We should all come to that realization at some point when we realize I'm a sinner and we should have fear, a fear that we're, we're going to rot in the pits of hell. Not just of our, our man. We need to fear the wrath of God. And we fear him in a reverent way. Yes. Not as in being scared of him, but it needs to be a reverent fear, a respectful fear. For he is our creator. He is our father. He is our judge. But I've got to tell you some sad news too. How come I'm always telling you some sad news? Because the sad news leads to good news. Amen. Sad news leads to that good news of joy and peace. Amen. See, out there in our, our world today, out there in this culture that we live in, and sadly, even right here at the church, we've lost that fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've lost it. You see, instead of elevating him to the place that he deserves as our creator, yeah. instead of us rising up to his expectations, we brought him down. Yeah. We have brought God down 
to someone who is tolerant of our sins. Oh, Lord, I don't Y'all feel the Holy Spirit, but I do. We brought him down. We use our own sense of judgment to think that well, we're pretty good. Well, I'm decent. I'm not as bad as that guy. Who are we to judge? Amen. But we do it. We do it every day. Well, I'm pretty good. God's only going to judge the worst. You know, those murders, those rapists, child molesters, right? All those people like that. That's what God's going to judge. But I'm here to tell you, we got, we got spineless preachers in the pulpit today. Amen. They're itching the ears of thumb-sucking Christians. We've got too many pew sitters wanting to be legit Christians. They're pretending the whole time. Deciding what's right and what's wrong. Deciding whether they're good or bad. They built their own golden caps. They created a God who fits their needs. Amen. But let me tell you something. All you sensitive Sally's out there, listen to me right now. It doesn't work like that. Amen. We have to go to what he says is right. Hallelujah. We have to go to the book. See the way he says to live. Not the way we say to live. Because our society is jacked up today. Our society says you can do this and you can do that. But that ain't what God says. But you see, we brought them down. We brought them down to say, well, it's going to be all right. Everybody's doing it. It don't work like that. No, what we need to do is we need to get back into this good book. Amen. We need to start reading it where it talks about God's wrath against sin. See, we want to gloss over that. We want to skip those parts. Talk about the by and by and the pie in the sky. Everything's going to be good. All beautiful and rosy posy. There'll be a lot of sadly mistaken people. We don't decide what's right and what's wrong. We don't decide if we're good people. No. The Bible says we're all like filthy rats. If you don't believe what I'm saying, go ahead. You can start in Mark, Mark the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Then you get done with that, you go to Romans chapter 1, verse 24, and then jump up to uh, 29 through 32. Then you can go to 1 Corinthians, you get to chapter 6, read verses 9 and 10. You go to the book of Colossians, get chapter 8, I think it's verse 5. Check those out. See where you stand against God's word. And see, that's just a few verses to get you jump started. You can just continue reading on through the whole Bible and find more and more and more. But if you can read these scriptures and you don't have any kind of eye-opening experience, then I pity you. That's a sad thing. Because this is where the truth's at. Amen. It's not in our society. It's not in what our government says it's right. It's not in what the neighbors are doing. It's not in what everyone out there is doing. What's right is what's in here. Amen. This is where your joy is coming from. This is where your peace is coming from. This Dictates, not us. We can't decide for ourselves. Amen. What we need to do is get our head out of our hind ends and start appreciating the good news of this book right here. Amen. We need to start appreciating our Savior who came and died on that cross right there so that you could live, so that you could have that joy that the angels spoke about in the Christmas story that the First Lady just read a moment ago. Imagine, if you will, somebody ever got it. <coughs> I'm standing in line at a bank, right? You rush in and you grab me by the arm. You tear my new shirt that I just got off the clearance rack, right? But you drag me out of the bank. And I say, well, what's going on? What are you doing? And then you say, well, I'm saving you from the bank. And then I'm probably going to say in a G-rated version, I'm good. Right? I'm good. Don't worry about it. I'm not in danger. No. I don't need saving. Right? I didn't see any danger. But now check this out. Let's go to the next scenario. I'm standing in that same line in the bank. 
But a mob of terrorists comes in and they take me hostage. Right? You rush in like you're Chuck Norris. Right? You save me. You get me out outside the bank and you save me. I'm out there safe now. What is the difference between the two? You see, in the first scenario, I didn't know that I was in danger. The danger was there, but I just didn't know nothing about it. The second scenario, I was in danger, and I knew I needed to be saved, right? Once they grabbed me, once the bad guys was around me, I knew I needed some saving, right? Somebody help me preach. It's getting good, come on. You see, we have to tell people that they're in danger. Yes. Oh, where's this going? Right? What our song say? Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ was born. Yes. You see, whether people believe it or not, they're in danger. Yes. And it's up to us to tell them. Yes. In a loving way. It's not your job to make them believe it. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Amen. But our job is to spread that gospel. Yes. Our job is to spread that good news. Yes. To tell them of good tidings and great joy that they can experience in their life. About eternity. Or damnation. That's our job. Amen. We're told to preach that good news. The angel said that this news was not just for the shepherds. Mm -mm. What did it say? It was for all people, right? Yes. It's for all the people. Not just some. Not just certain folks that we think are good. Certain ones that we think should be in heaven. The news is for everyone. Even that guy you don't like. Mm -hmm. Come on. Even for that girl you can't stand. The good news is for everyone. Yeah. Who are you to judge? Who gets to hear it or who don't? I'm going to close with another story. It's about a family who was dirt road poor. It was written by a little girl who was part of the story. She was a little girl when this happened. And she grew up and she wrote this story. It's another family that, like I said, they were dirt road poor. They were hurting. Daddy normally would give them a, a Christmas tree, get some presents for Christmas. But this year, he'd been laid off. See, he didn't have any money. They was barely able to even eat. So the children, they, they say, are we going to have a tree this year? Can we at least have a tree? Daddy's like, I don't know. I, say, I don't know. I'll see what I can do. So he gets to thinking for a little bit, and he goes outside into the, to the shed. A little while later, he comes walking out, and he's got a two-by-four. And in the side of that two-by-four, he had drilled some holes in the side of it. And he went across the street to the neighbor's house where they had some property out there, a whole bunch of pine trees out there. And he asked the, the owner of the house, he said, would you mind if I trimmed off some of these branches, maybe some of these trees that ain't looking so good, and, and get me some branches? And they agreed to it. And, and Daddy cut them branches off, and he, he stuck those branches in the holes of that two-by-four, and he brought it to the house. And, and he, he said, here, this, this is our tree right here. Well, about the time he was doing that, there was a knock at the door. The children, they open up the door, and, and there's a lady standing there. It was a lady who owned the property where Daddy had just got some branches. And her and her little son, they were standing there at the doorway. And she had a Christmas tree, the most beautiful Christmas tree these children had ever seen. And the son, he was holding a few presents. She said, I just thought we'd bring this over to you. See, she had a gift for them. But let me ask you this question. How do you think this neighbor would have felt if that family had refused that gift? 
Huh? Would you think she was hurt? To say the least. And rightly so. so. That would hurt anybody's feelings. If they had refused a gift, they would have missed out on the Christmas card. Come on. You see, a gift only brings joy if it's received. Did you hear what I said? A gift only brings joy if it's received. So how do you think God feels after sacrificing his own son so that you could have eternal life? He already did it. Now the choice is up to us. Some people accept it. Some people reject it. I rejected it for many years. I know the Lord was calling me many times. I'd come up to the front of the altar and, and said the sinner's prayer multiple times. The Holy Spirit was working me over. But then I walked right out the door and I just kept living my own life. You see, I didn't accept. I didn't accept that gift. I look at it now and I think it's kind of like spitting in God's face to reject that wonderful gift. The only way to know true abiding joy is to make it right with your God. Amen. Amen. You hear me? That's the only way you're going to have joy. I mean, if you want the world, it'll give you some temporary, some superficial happiness. It will. But it's not going to last. I can guarantee you that. So the greatest gift that you could ever receive is to accept. The only way you're going to receive that joy, that Christmas joy, remember I said earlier last all year, every single day, it ain't just about Christmas Day or Christmas Eve. I'm talking about the Christmas joy that is every day of the year, that is forevermore through all of eternity. You can have it, but you have to accept it. It's already done. Amen. But the question is, will you accept it? Amen. Amen. Amen.